Hello, everyone. Welcome to an unusual episode of Astronomy Cast. This week, I'm all by myself, and I'm coming to you from Cosmo Quest Central, and I have completely lost my mouse. There it is. Um, I'm going solo today on everything. You may hear some background noise. Uh, I have folks working around on building all the awesome things that you see around here. And um, so we're going to do what we can, and by we, I think I mean I today, uh, do what we can to answer some of your questions. We're going to check out some new technology and just try and have a good time. Um, so nothing big, mostly just to have fun and test some tech. Now, part of what we're testing is if we can get Nightbot working in our chat. I think Susie's in there and she may be running some experiments, testing some commands while she's in there, seeing what she can get in. Um, so <laughs> I already see Peter asking, where is Pamela? Uh, I am in the Illinois offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. This is where the technology team works, as well as the psychology research and some of the educational staff. Uh, this is in historic downtown Edwardsville. I am across the street and a bit diagonal from a courthouse where Abraham Lincoln gave one of his speeches in a building that was probably here when the speech was given. Uh, so our offices are kind of old school. You can see the electricity is running on the outsides of the walls in here. Um, but this is where the magic happens. This is where I normally work. Um, <laughs> so so I, I have to admit, I don't have coffee today. Uh, it's one of those days, so you're going to have to deal with me with a little less caffeine than normal but I'm gonna follow your questions and the one thing I just need to figure out uh, <laughs> hello everyone in chat the one thing left that I need to figure out is just how to get Nightbot open so I can take a look at uh, what all is set up um, I, I I'm not entirely sure where the logins are. So pardon me while I be confused for a moment at all the things, all of them, simultaneously. Um, okay, let's see how this goes. Testing, testing, no, that won't do it right. Um, okay, so I can't do it there. Let's try doing it over here. So Nightbot, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a way to do all sorts of cool, interesting commands where instead of having to type in all the information I'm interested in you knowing, I can instead type exclamation mark one or two things and it does everything else for me. If this is working correctly, I'll be able to use it to um, get information to you just a little bit easier. And it looks like there are a bunch of cool things already set up. So let me see if any of these work. No. Okay. I will debug this later. I tried. I failed. I am not worthy of Nightbot on YouTube occasionally. Okay, so, um, wait, I'm live on the other link. I, I'm live on, on the link I thought I was live on. Hmm. Okay, we're having some confusion here. So... If the folks in chat can see me, can the folks on chat see me? Hi, Astro. I see you, Astro B. I'm not sure if you can see me. I'm so confused. Okay, switching streams, I guess. Okay, sorry for that, folks. I, we're having all sorts of interesting tech going on. 
So let me see if I can pop the chat out and um, hopefully the folks in chat can tell me where things are going. Let me see if in here I have Nightbot working. No. Okay. So that experiment, I shall try more on my own time and I will figure it out more later. So the real reason that I'm here today is to answer your questions. So I'm going to do a normal show intro in a moment. I'm going to record what I'm doing. Uh, I see that some of the good folks in the Weekly Space Hangout have already queued up a ton of questions for me uh, so that I can scroll without screwing up things in OBS. I'm going to be reading the questions on my phone. Uh, Thank you guys for being so good about using the question mark emoji. That makes it so much easier to find all the questions. I'm just going to scroll to the top of all the questions that they've dropped in. And then I'm going to go ahead and get going on things. Um, okay, almost done scrolling. Okay, here we go. I am working to hit the record button. Hello, Chad. It's just me today, Chad. You don't have to wait on anyone else's audio. Just me. And I forgot today's date. I need to look up today's date. Sorry, Chad. I am a horrible human being today. My phone is not telling me today's date. Tell me today's date. Something tell me today's date. Phone, you're useless. Uh, uh, okay, so Monday is going to be February 12th. So we already have a show for that. Uh, this is going to be an undated, actually, probably. Okay. I will simply say the date we're recording on, which is February 9th. Okay, sorry, Chad. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello and welcome to Astronomy Cast. This episode is a special episode with questions and answers with just me, Dr. Pamela Gay. Fraser Kane, my normal co-host, is off gallivanting around the planet and I'm using the wrong microphone to record. I'm going to have to start over. Sorry, everyone. Um, you are all now learning how much... Ah, uh, I rely on my home computer to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, let's try this again. Hello. Yes, I now have good healthy wave functions. Hello, Chad. Astronomy Cast, special episode recorded on February 9th. 2018. I am Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am coming to you on a different microphone than normal. Please let us know how you like this. And I am coming from a different place than normal. While Fraser is off gallivanting through Iceland, I, I'm at work. So I am recording from the offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific here in southern Illinois in historic downtown area. I am diagonally across the street from where Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. And today's episode, while Fraser is off, all I'm going to be doing is, uh, well, answering your questions. This is an unnumbered episode. This is bonus free content. And I hope you enjoy this experiment. If you do, it may become a more regular thing. So for those of you who are in the chat, uh, we are trying Nightbot. So go ahead and experiment. Those of you who are listening to the podcast, we record Astronomy Cast most Fridays at 2 p.m. Central, which is 3 p.m. Boston, noon Vancouver. And uh, if you math it all out, that's 8 p.m. London. And we invite you to come and join us in these live recordings, interact with us through the chat, and this is where all the questions come from. And I have all your questions in front of me. 
So I'm going to start with one that was put in by the Weekly Space Hangout crew. The question is, any word on the Event Horizon telescope results? Uh, no, not yet. Sorry, stay tuned. That one was easy. I like those. I see another one saying, I remember reading a press release recently about a paper that observed an older elliptical galaxy with its companion galaxies arranged in more of a disk than expected. So this is actually something we're starting to find more and more often. As we look in great detail at massive galaxies and then at these smaller galaxies around them, we start to see things that share their rotational axes, that share their orientation in space. In general, we expect and we actually see that galaxies as a whole are randomly distributed across the sky so that if you add them all up and take into consideration things like gravitational microlensing, everything averages out to a circle and the orientations are randomly scattered in all different directions. The thing is, when you're looking at things on smaller scales where gravitational influences and the kinematics of the gas where everything formed all play a role, you can start to see that instead of having this random alignment, everything has baked in. Perhaps a good way to think of it is a primordial alignment. These are the alignments that the gas had as these older systems formed, as knots and eddies in the gas and dust that formed these systems formed, and so everything ends up sharing an orientation. These are results that began to be hinted at back in 2010, and the more we look, the more detailed we look, the more we see that galaxies have a way of influencing one another, which is kind of awesome. So I, I have another question coming in. This is from Jorn. Uh, he asks, now that Elon has given us cheap access to space and the launch cadence of SpaceX is increasing, are NASA considered considering developing a standard bus for planetary satellites? For an orbiter, I can name at least a dozen targets in our solar system. Why not throw weight concerns out the window, develop a big one-size-fits-all satellite? and uh, just keep launching. Now, it, I've seen this question written a number of different ways by a number of people. The current situation that we have is every spacecraft is kind of unique, not totally unique. We, we see entire evolutions of families of, of spacecraft where initially we had our pioneers, our voyagers, all the way up through Cassini built very much on the same initial frame, built on evolving versions of the same hardware and software. Lots of evolution going on across those decades. But it all went back to the same system. And we see, unfortunately, as we try new things, as, as we develop new things, and as we launch on more and more different kinds of spacecraft, a greater diversity in the spacecraft hookups that we're using. There's things that were designed for the space shuttle, there's things that are designed for the deltas, there's things that are designed for the atlas, there's things being designed for space launch system, and things being designed for the Falcon series of rockets and the Ariana series of rockets, and it turns out none of these suckers are compatible. If you want to stick your spacecraft in any one of these fairings, you have to specially design it. And, and this is in part so that the manufacturers can say, well, you've booked with me, you're going to wait, and you're going to fly with me. It's also built in part because, well, one person comes up with a standard, no one else has a standard yet, they don't publish their standard necessarily, somebody else comes out with a standard, they may know the other guy's standard, and they're like, but my standard is better. And all of this leads to every manufacturer being slightly different. We see this in cars. I drive a Jeep, my husband drives a Subaru, both our cars are currently in the shop awaiting pieces. And, and this is because both of us drive cars that are more than 20 years old. But the other problem is the brake line for my car and the brake line for his car are different, and I need a brake line, and they don't have my brake line in stock. He needed, I don't even remember what he needed for his car, wasn't in stock, because everything's incompatible, and you have to wait for the specialty piece. Manufacturers do this. 
we have begun to get lucky with software and hardware where we're seeing USB becoming a standard that is slowly evolving, where now we're moving into the world of USB-C from USB micro and mini and the old style ones. We're stuck. Uh, things change over time. And unfortunately, with rockets, we don't yet have that plug-and-play USB style, much physically bigger fairing hookup to just drop your spacecraft into any rocket you want to drop it in. So that, unfortunately, is is where we are and where we're stuck on on the rocket side. That was probably far longer of an answer than you were looking for. Uh, so so I see that Astrid B is asking, is there a big question for our view of physics when we think the universe expanded faster than the speed of light after the Big Bang and the early plasma is now 95% unknown transparent stuff. So, so we have actually a really good understanding of things. And it's important to note that the universe was expanding faster than the speed of light, but things weren't moving through space faster than the speed of light. So the speed of light isn't getting broken. It's still the limit. And it's simply a matter of the elements of space between two points. If you add up how much each of those bits is growing, the addition of all the bits between two points causes those two points to perceive one another as moving apart at faster than the speed of light. Now, we can actually look out at great distances in our modern universe and see objects out in the distance that are so far away that all the kiloparsecs of space between us and them, all the megaparsecs of space between us and them, adds up to an expansion greater than that speed of light. This is because the universe as a whole is expanding at somewhere between 60 and 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec of space. So you get enough megaparsecs in there, and all those 62, 63, whatever your preferred current value is, all those kilometers per second per megaparsec add up, and the sum of them means two things are going faster than the speed of light apart from one another due to expansion, not motion through space-time. Now, in the very early universe, the situation was even more fascinating. In the first three minutes, we went from a single point that we can't describe really well we'd like to. Uh, we go from this single point that starts expanding and there's nuclear reactions, there's an epic of inflation where everything goes from this single point to the size of our solar system. And during this wild time, um, we end up with things moving much faster than the speed of light due to each little tiny infinitesimal size of space expanding so fast. So instead of talking about 60 kilometers per second per megaparsec, we're talking about 60 kilometers per second per itty bitty little tiny unimaginably small bit of space. And that's kind of amazing. Now, I, I'm seeing uh, folks in the chat are confused about what they've tuned into. And I will remind people who may have skipped through the front of this episode, uh, this week, Fraser Kane, my co-host, he is off in Iceland. So we are doing an experiment. And uh, I'm sitting here answering your questions. And I really appreciate the folks in the Weekly Space Hangout crew that all of you are welcome to join at wshcrew.space. They are uh, pulling the questions out of YouTube for me and making this really easy for me to do on the fly. Uh, so moving on to the next question. Uh, Sedmet or Sidemet, I'm not sure. Um, is asking, I have heard that Pluto has a blue sky. Does the sky uh, does the sky actually look blue to the eyes of a human who is standing on the surface? Or does it just mean that the atmosphere looks blue when it is observed from outside of the planet and the images are processed properly? 
I really love that question because the color of the sky is one of these things that I just really enjoy thinking about in different situations. Now the color of the sky comes strictly from scattering of light. We have what appears to be a completely opaque sky, a sky that doesn't allow us to see stars and planets during the day unless you know exactly where to look and you're probably using binoculars or a telescope. With our opaque sky, what we're actually seeing is light trying to come straight through the atmosphere is instead bouncing around, getting absorbed and re-released by the atoms and molecules in our atmosphere. It turns out that the super short wavelengths of light, the blues, the ultraviolets, are the ones that are the most likely to get blocked, reflected straight away, or just scattered in all directions. And as an atmosphere gets thicker and thicker and thicker, you begin to see longer and longer wavelengths get scattered. When our sun is sitting down on the horizon, there's a vast amount of atmosphere that that sunlight is traveling through to get to us. And in that moment, the light is able to scatter all the way out to redder wavelengths, giving us these beautiful red sunsets. Now, when the sun is straight overhead, it's only those blues that are getting reflected, or ref sorry, are getting uh, scattered from the Raleigh scattering in all directions. Now, with Pluto, you have very little atmosphere at all. I, I doubt if you were lying on the surface, basically frozen to the icy surface, because it, it's kind of that you don't touch ice that cold because you just stick to it and probably die. Uh, if you made the mistake of laying down on Pluto and looking straight up through its very, very thin atmosphere, you probably wouldn't notice with your eyeballs any scattering of sunlight. Now, if the sun was low, low, low on the horizon, you might begin to see a bluish haze, but it really does take using instrumentation, probably looking through that back lit behind it, looking through the thickest possible amount of atmosphere, and then integrating that light over time to really reveal this, this blue atmosphere that has scattered out only these longer wavelengths of light. Now, what's cool to think about is each world will have a unique viewing experience based on the density of its atmosphere, how far it is from the sun, and all these different effects. So we will slowly be able to get sunsets that each look truly unique as we get more and more opportunities to land rovers on other worlds and look out at our own sun setting or rising on the horizon. If you haven't already, I highly recommend looking up some of the sunrise and sunset pictures that have been taken by Mars Curiosity, Spirit, and Opportunity. The Martian sunset is this amazing blue color that is, is just glorious to look at. Okay, going on to see what other questions that we have. Scott C. is asking, as an object's velocity increases, does the number of interactions it has with gravitons increase? Now, this is one of those things that I don't know how to answer. And the reason that I don't entirely know how to answer it is we can't measure gravitons, just don't know how to do it. And there is some debate on whether or not there is a particle physics necessitated thing for gravity. Is it geometry? Is it string theory? Is it, is it part of how we think of bosons carrying force? We just don't know. Now, if it is that standard boson interactions, just like when you stick a magnet to your refrigerator, there's actually little bosons, they're called virtual photons, jumping back and forth between your magnet and your refrigerator to hold that magnet on the refrigerator. If this is true, the more gravity that something expresses, the more gravitons you'll be having going back and forth. Now with special relativity, we have an object's inertia, the combination 
of its mass and its velocity are causing it to act as though it has a greater mass. Its number of atoms is not increasing. It is not going to spontaneously turn into a black hole just by getting accelerated fast enough. But its inertia increases. And, and I really need to dig into whether or not that means that its gravitons also increase. So I don't totally know the answer to that. My gut, which is often a liar, my gut thinks that, yes, if there is a, a boson explanation for gravity and the idea of the graviton is completely true and completely valid, that, yes, as your uh, relativistic mass increases, there would be more interactions with gravitons. But as I said, my stomach could be a liar. Okay, so uh, I see, oh, it's so many awesome questions, scanning, looking. Um, <laughs> someone asks, who played Forrest Gump? That was Tom Hanks, who absolutely loves space. Uh, I, I'm a fan of people who are fans of space. Okay, so another question. Shouldn't volcanism be an important indicator for possible life since a dead planet wouldn't have enough energy for life to form? Or is water contact with rocks enough? Geologic activity is why I am hopeful for exomoons. So the three qualities that we require for life are a solvent like water. Other things work. Methane as a, ga as a liquid works. Uh, we need a temperature gradient, an energy condition where you can have reactions getting driven. And we need nutrients of some sort. Now, the way you may have learned this at some point is you need water, you need sunlight, you need food. This got modified after we figured out, oh, deep sea vents that have no light can support life. This got modified to you need water, you need heat, and you need food, but really breaking it all down. You just need thermal gradient, solvent, and building blocks for that life. It's entirely possible that any of these icy moons out there that have the thermal gradient, that have the solvent, they have the liquid water, and that potentially have all the building blocks for life, all the carbon organic molecules, it's possible that these places support life as we're not used to thinking about it. What's amazing to think about is all of these other solar systems that may or may not have a habitable zone in terms of that band around the sun that is capable of keeping water at its triple point, that place where it can be ice, liquid, or gas at the surface, places that don't have that might still, because of plate tectonics, because of all of these other processes that can heat the inside of a world, it's possible these places might support life. Now, looking around our solar system, the places that we see as most likely to have life are indeed the active worlds. These are the places where we see the ice geysers, the volcanism, the thermal gradient driving liquid forms of a solvent to be active. Mars used to be alive. It used to have plate tectonics. It used to have volcanism. It used to have a thick atmosphere. And it may be that life that developed under those much more hospitable conditions has found a way to continue on today. But we don't know. We, we haven't looked deep enough. Uh, we, we are still hoping, hopeful, but I think most scientists really consider that the places most likely to have life are, are actually uh, Europa, Enceladus, and these other giant icy moons. So, so yes, uh, these, these are the awesome things that we hope for. Okay, so our instro is asking, what created the sonic booms when the two Falcon side cores returned to Earth? That is 
Uh, so this was relayed from Graham Wahlberg, who's on YouTube. Now, if, if you watched the video, what you may have noticed is you see the two rockets landing side by side in beautiful, glorious production, perfect camera angle. It was stunning. And then after they land is, is when you hear the sonic boom. And they clearly weren't going faster than the speed of sound on landing or really bad things would have happened to their side-by-side -side landing pads. Now, I'm actually not sure if that sonic boom either was from higher up when they were going the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound, or if it was the interaction of their engines and the ground. So I'm just not actually sure. Uh, and now I really want to know. But those are the two things that it's likely to come from. And because sound moves so much slower than light, and they were using really long lenses, things were really zoomed in. Those cameras were not close to the landing pad. You, you can really experience the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. Okay, looking to see. Talkie Toaster, which is a fabulous username, asks, uh, <laughs> I love all the qualifications on this. I have a question, a sensible question, a question that will test the limits of your new IQ and stretch the sinews of your knowledge to bursting point. The question is this, given that God is infinite and the universe is also infinite, would you like a toasted tea cake? I would always like a toasted tea cake. The answer is yes. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so many questions I don't know the answers to. I'm going to be willing to admit that. One question is, does metal weld itself in space? If so, is it good enough for manufacturing? My understanding is that under certain vacuum conditions, if you touch two pieces of metal together, they're like, yep, we're stuck. I don't know if that counts as welding the way we're normally used to thinking about welding or if it's this special one-off, kind of like it's welded, but it's not the same thing, and I certainly have no idea how strong it is. That is, now I'm curious, and I want to know. Ah, uh, okay, continuing to scroll, looking for more questions. Scrolling. So from Noel Rupenthal, how are ULA and NASA going to be able to justify multi-billion dollar development projects when projects like Falcon Heavy can be developed for only half a billion? And, and this is kind of the question of the week. And this is where I want to say I am recording this episode on uh, equipment that was donated to us. So, so I, I am not on NASA time at the moment. Um, and, and thank you so much, you who know who you are, for donating the mixing board that allows me to sound good while talking to you all today. Uh, anyways, so with that caveat in place, we, we do have this kind of frustrating moment of the space launch systems being developed by ULA, which is a consortium of many of the old space corporations. Big space, you might think. Uh, it's expensive. It It's not going to turn out that many rockets. The launch schedule shows that the rockets they have planned are fully booked into the 2030s, basically. And they're not cheap. Not cheap at all. And while the Falcon Heavy only launches about half the weight, half the mass, as what they plan to be able to launch with the space launch systems. If you're trying to construct something in space, which is what most of the early launches of the space launch system is planned to do, you can actually launch things in two pieces for substantially less, less cost using the Falcon Heavy. Now what you can't do with the Falcon Heavy that you can do with the space launch system is accelerate things to a much larger velocity for getting out of the Earth-Moon system. That is going to have its benefits when we start looking to getting things heading out towards the outer solar system, when we start wanting to launch larger mass objects out towards Mars. But the question is, will Elon Musk and his BFR 
Uh, I like to think it's the big fabulous rocket. Uh, it's not. I can't say what it is on air. Uh, the BFR, when when it's ready to go, if it beats SLS to, out of the gate, I'm. I don't know what Congress is going to do. And this starts to get at the politics of this, where we have these companies that NASA built itself upon Boeing, Lockheed, Martin Marinetta, who took us through so many generations of spacecraft from Mercury up through the space shuttle. And they're building SLS on this legacy technology where they're bringing back the engines that were designed for the space shuttle in the 60s and 70s, the solid rocket boosters that were designed and are being evolved, but again, come from the space shuttle. These are not reusable rockets. But these are companies that have massive lobbying arms that are major American corporations. They supply massive numbers of jobs. And so it starts to become, do we maintain these additional companies and these additional rockets so that we have options in case there is a major engineering failure and uh, for whatever reason, FAA revokes the ability of SpaceX to launch for some period of time. Do we keep funding them to make sure that we have a diversity of places to go and buy our rockets? Do we keep funding them because of the jobs? And these are all questions that I'm really glad I don't have to answer, but our Congress critters here in the United States do, and I don't know what they're going to decide to do. At a certain point, there's what's called the sunk cost fallacy, where once you've started buying into something, no matter how much the cost overruns are, it's very hard to say this isn't worth finishing. I, I can think of very few examples in history, a bridge to nowhere, a uncompleted super accelerator for particle physics in Texas. I can think of very few examples of places where we didn't fall prey to the sunk cost fallacy and just keep building until it was done. I don't know what the choice is going to be here. I know <laughs> that if Musk does what he says he's going to do, that there'd be so much more money available for science, so much more money available for so many different things. If we went the Falcon route, I don't know what the choice will be. Anyways, that's my two cents as a private individual funded through your donations. Thank you for supporting Astronomy Cast. You allow me to, to be here and, and give you my educated opinions. Okay, moving on. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Gareth Wilton is saying, a Trappist-1 planet has a lot of water with regards to the Earth's form formation, has the possibility of its water existing first in orbit, then later accreting its remaining mass ever been considered. So let, let me try and unpack that a little bit. Our solar system, and as far as we know, all solar systems, formed out of a cloud of gas and dust molecules, atoms, that collapsed due to some sort of a gra gravitational nudge that set things out of balance and, and awesome things happened. When we look at the Orion star forming region, we're able to see these protoplanetary cocoons where solar systems are going to be emerging. In these systems, you have all of the atoms that will eventually lead to a solar system. Some of these atoms are in completely different molecules than where there will eventually be. Others, including water, are already happily being the molecule they were destined to be. This means that when we look at meteorites, when we look at comets, we see the water. When we look at these TRAPPIST systems, it is completely reasonable to think that to a certain degree, these planets formed rich in water initially. We don't know how much that water got baked out by that angry young X-ray emitting red dwarf that it suffered under the temper tantrums of in the early days of that solar system. What we also can infer if all solar systems work vaguely similarly, is these planets also got bombarded by meteorites that were rich in water and by comets that were rich in water in various ratios. 
how much each of these different things, comets, meteorites, and original water, how much all of these things played a role, these are things I don't know how we're going to eventually answer. But those are the things that play into how much water each of these worlds have. One of the newest discoveries that, that's kind of been blowing my mind lately is realizing that our own planet's crust is rich in water at deeper levels. We, or at least I was taught early on, Earth was pretty much baked dry, and then the water had to come back to us. Now it's looking like there's still leftover primordial water. It was just at a lower depth. Okay, getting back into the questions. Uh, David Joseph Wesley from YouTube asks, how many near-Earth objects are discovered by amateur astronomers compared to the number discovered by NASA? Are there observations going on for today's asteroid flyby? I'm sure that there are a ton of different projects planned to observe today's asteroid flyby. There's a number of scientists that work hand in hand with amateur astronomers saying, hey, all of you folks that own your own telescopes and can point them at whatever the heck you want, can you please go look at my object? And volunteers do this, and we are so grateful for the unpaid, amazing effort that you guys do that lets us do great science. Now, when it comes to blanketing the sky with observations, it turns out that modern day surveys are starting to kind of dwarf what the amateurs do by the numbers. But this isn't to say that the amateurs aren't still doing amazing work. It used to be back in the late 80s, early 90s, even into the early 2000s, that you could go out, pick a chunk of sky near the ecliptic, on the ecliptic, that region of the sky that the planets pass through night after night. And you had a pretty good chance, if you slowly and methodically observed your patch, of finding a new asteroid that had never previously been discovered. Now that we have these massive surveys, things like Lanier, that are out there observing large areas of the sky with high quality equipment using robots that do everything fairly automagically, the robots are winning. They are simply winning along the ecliptic. So the chance of an amateur going out and discovering something in that area of the sky being observed by the robots and being the first one to find it is much lower. But the sky is vast and there are large areas of the sky that are no longer, well it's not that they're no longer, it's that they were never being observed by the robots. And there's still opportunity for you to go out and pick a new swath of sky. And you're probably going to have to look at it a lot longer because the bulk of the stuff is along the disk of our solar system, along that ecliptic. But new things are still getting found out there by amateurs on a regular basis. And, and this is really kind of awesome. So all of you have a chance to go out. You can get involved through the Minor Planet Center. They will have you observe a series of known objects, make observations. They will verify that you have the quality in your data that they need to do science. Then they will issue you an observer code, and you're off and running. You can become trained in how to discover new rocks and ice orbiting through our solar system. Okay, going back to the question bag. Um, scrolling. <laughs> uh, so, so Bill S. said, can Pamela speak to something that came up about 10 episodes ago? Why cannot we just fire all our nuclear waste into the sun? She talked about escape velocity making this impossible. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much that it's impossible as it's just not, it just doesn't really make sense. So if you want to get rid of your garbage by throwing it at the sun, you have to provide all the energy to safely get it off the earth. You are running a huge risk. If that, if that explodes while it's getting off the planet, uh, 
yeah, that's bad because now you have radiation in the upper atmosphere. This is why above ground nuclear testing is strictly prohibited by international treaty. There is a sufficient amount of, and this is heavy stuff, nuclear waste is made of some of the heaviest atoms we've got. It's high density, high, it's, it's weight. It's a lot of weight. You're going to be using multiple launches to get this stuff up there. And then when you aim it towards the sun, it, what if you miss? I mean, that's, that's just bad. Now you have nuclear waste that's permanently in orbit around the sun. So I just don't recommend, let's find a geologically stable place to just bury it. It's much safer to find a geologically stable place to just bury it. Okay, moving on to things hopefully less deadly. Uh, looking... Okay, so uh, Ziora says, have you heard that scientists use the Kilanova to prove that gravity is not leaking out of our universe into another? I, I've heard this. I, I don't know the details, but I just love the fact that we have a new word called a Kilanova. This is what they are calling the explosion of dead stars that occurred when two neutron stars collided back in, I believe it was August, allowing us to see an event in all the colors of the spectrum and outside of the electromagnetic spectrum when we detected gravitational waves, gamma ray burst, and then we're able to follow it in radio and optical and everything else. This double neutron star collision, uh, it's now termed a kilonova, and Theorists doing things that I don't fully follow the math on without thinking really hard, and I haven't set aside the time to do that yet, have said, and I've heard enough people I trust repeat this, that this particular experiment indicates that gravity isn't leaking into other galaxies, uh, other universes in the multi-universe, if we do indeed have a multiverse. So it's cool. I wish I knew more. The thing about question shows is is you guys uh, have the freedom to ask more questions than I have the freedom to find the time for. But it's great to think about all the things that we now have the ability to learn. We now have the ability to figure out and do. Okay, looking to see. Uh, Raza Sadiq asks, how will this car survive in solar winds and in the asteroid belt? Referring to Elon Musk's launch Tesla Roadster. So as, as I talked about earlier in this episode, Elon Musk successfully launched the Falcon Heavy, the two side boosters, the Falcon 9s attached to the sides, both returned safely, causing these sonic booms that we discussed. And the cargo he chose to launch was his personal car. And this is a somewhat controversial act. There's a lot of people that wish that he had launched a science payload. And I've heard a lot of people say that they wish that even if it wasn't a major science payload, that it had at least been kids' experiments. Now, this is one of those situations where I don't think there is a winning answer. Because if it had completely blown up and gone kablooey, which he was kind of expecting it would do at a certain level, then you have crying children if, if you launch kids' experiments, and all the money that went into developing those payloads is lost. If you launch a science experiment, that will have been paid for by the National Science Foundation, by NASA, by somebody, and all that funding is lost, and now you have sad grad students and researchers. It's, if it blew up and he'd flown anything of meaning, there would have been great dismay and crying. Now, if he blew up his personal roadster, Everyone just laughs at him. Oh, that stupid billionaire. And what's, what's it off of his back if, if his personal car gets blown up? He's a billionaire, and they're making new models of Teslas. So in case of explosion, 
he had a payload, it cost nobody but him any money, and would cause no sadness. In case of a successful launch, if he had a successful launch that had a not very exciting science payload because no one wanted to risk a major mission, people would have been like, meh, that's nice. If it was filled with kids' experiments, people would have been like, meh, that's nice. We're, we're very meh about things that aren't sexy. Now, that roadster, first of all, made him laugh, made people laugh with him, and while there were people upset, God, it looked beautiful. That was the most amazing PR stunt ever. And while I'm not generally in favor of PR stunts, when you expect your rocket to blow up, not making little kids cry is a perfectly reasonable concern to have. So there's a whole lot of mixed feels. Now, in terms of where this roadster is now going, it's, it's not just a free flying roadster, it's actually like mounted on a trellis. It's safe-ish. Uh, I don't know how safe you can be when you're an unmodified Tesla Roadster on a fairly significant orbit through the solar system. The, the thing to remember about our solar system is it's mostly empty space. It's really hard to hit something. It's currently, they, they over-accelerated it. So instead of simply going into an orbit that will cross Mars orbit and then head back towards the inner solar system, it's going to keep going. And its greatest point, according to the predictions that I saw this morning, will have it passing through the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt is very, very, very empty. It is so empty, in fact, that you can pretty much stand on any asteroid that doesn't have like a baby asteroid as a moon, and you will see no other asteroids. There was a description I saw of it a few days ago, and I'm really hoping I get this right, but if a basketball is the sun, the asteroid belt is half of a sugar cube ground up and spread out a foot wide all the way around that basketball. I may have the sun too big in this analogy, but it's, it's along this order of just not that much stuff. And those grains of sugar are still way too big for the asteroids in this particular model. So it's probably not going to hit anything. It's all the scientists that I've seen trying to figure out predictions all think it's probably going to be, and I know some of you are here, which I really appreciate, uh, all predict it's probably going to be order of millions of years before it hits something uh, more substantial than like a rock that'll damage its windshield. So the windshield will probably be the first to go. Uh, anyways, random guess. And the only real sadness I have is it would have been an amazing opportunity, especially for ham radio operators, if this thing had a long-term beacon on it, something that would just sit there and regularly pulse out a signal. But that would have cost extra money, that would have added extra chaos to the system, and so it's simply going to be quite quiet. Now, I did see earlier this morning predictions that it will be back in our neighborhood in February of 2022. So there's a chance, depending on technology, that we will get to uh, see our Roadster once again. And I really want to see how much damage the sun's UV does to that amazing wax and paint job that that Tesla had. So this does at least give us our chance to see how does the space suit that is an actual like production line spacesuit how does it survive and how does a tesla fare in the radiation of space now we are starting to run out of time i'm going to look for one more question uh, scrolling through all the questions uh so so raza sadikas asks was it a real Tesla Roadster or a dummy car which is in space? No, it was Elon's actual car. This is the car this man used to just hop in and drive around. He said it was completely unmodified. They clearly waxed the bejesus out of this thing. This was one smooth finish on this car. So it was clean. 
the only real modifications I've heard about was they replaced the screen with a board that says don't panic. There is a towel in the glove compartment because you should never go anywhere without a towel. And apparently there is a matchbox car of a Tesla Roadster with its own star man inside the matchbox car that is, I believe, on the dashboard of the Tesla, just to completely play with the minds of whatever future archaeologists have lost records of what this thing is and find it someday in the future. Now, most people believe that someone's going to go out and grab this thing and stick it in a museum before we get so far in the future that people no longer remember this launch. It's, it's still kind of hilarious to think about. But yes, it's a completely unmodified, but has been road driven, regular everyday Tesla Roadster. So yeah, that's, that's what I know. Now, uh, I've been sitting here talking for about an hour answering your questions. Before I end for the day, I just wanted to remind everyone out there, we are in the process of doing some major research into what is it that causes people like you to listen to podcasts, to engage in things like this, and what is it that we can do to make your listening experience and your learning experience even better. What can we provide you on the website? What tools, what support, what content do you want to hear? We want to know it all. In addition to trying to understand about our podcast listening audience, we're also trying to learn what can we do to help encourage you folks to do more citizen science? Other than to remind you, you can go to cosmoquest.org and get involved in trying to help label photos from astronauts and study our own planet Earth to go and help out mapping the moon, Mars, Mercury, Vesta, so that we can find the safe places to land and the scientifically interesting places to explore. We also have a citizen science survey. And we know that there are people out there who use citizen science in their classrooms or don't. And we want to not know why people are making these two different choices. Links to all of these surveys will be on our website, CosmicQuest.com. Please, if, if you can take a moment and you've always wondered, what can I do to help these guys? This is one of those things you can do that will really help us. Please, please, please go complete our surveys. Now, before I take off, I do need to thank you guys because this show would not be possible without you. Your donations through patreon.com slash astronomycast allow us to pay Susie, who sets up all of our episodes, to keep Chad, our audio engineer, going. And we need Chad because you don't want to hear what happens when I try an audio engineer. And you're also helping to support Fraser and I and our ability to go out and spread the good word of science around the world. So thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors. And thank you also to all of you who donate through PayPal instead because you just like PayPal. We are fine either way and we love you both ways. And we love those of you who can't donate. All we ask is please go do our survey. Just do our survey. Anyways. Thank you so much. This has been a weird and unusual episode of Astronomy Cast. Let us know if you liked it. Let us know if this is something you want to see more of. And I will see you next week. Maybe not at this time, because I realized I have an international flight at what will be an hour from this time next week. So things may be a little bit earlier next week. Sorry, Susie. I know I'm springing this on you. Uh, but thank you to all of you and uh, those of you who support us on Patreon. Office hours start in about 15 minutes. Thank you. This has been a special episode of Astronomy Cast, recorded February 9th, 1918, 19, 2018. I am Dr. Pamela Gay. I am the Director of Citizen Science and Technology at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And I thank you for joining me. Have a wonderful morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Thanks.